Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Londo. I'm a professor and the Extension Forestry Coordinator in the Forestry Department at Mississippi State University. And I'm here today to talk to you all a little bit about forest health. And this, this presentation is going to be by no means all-encompassing, but it'll cover at least some of the basics and hopefully give you all some good ideas for things you can do in your, on your own forest land in regards to improving or maintaining its forest health. And this is chapter 13 in the Managing the Family Forest in Mississippi publication. This is available at uh, www.msucares.com, um, where it's you know, downloadable as PDF files by chapter. And, or if you'd like to have a hard copy of it, you can email me and I'll be, uh, and see my email address there, ajlondo at cfr.msstate.edu, and I'll be more than happy to uh, mail you a hard copy of it. But real quickly, what we'll be talking about today um, forest health is kind of a nebulous subject area, so we're going to start out talking about what is forest health. And then I'm going to focus on Mississippi, but a lot of the things that affect forest health in Mississippi affect forest health elsewhere. Insects, diseases, invasive species, and natural disturbances, followed by what can be done to, pr to protect forest health. Forest health, and this, this definition comes from the Dictionary of Forestry published by the Society of American Foresters is the perceived condition of a forest derived from concerns about its age, structure, composition, function, vigor, presence of insects or disease, and resilience to disturbance. Okay. That's great. That's a really nice definition. But, what, but the problem is, is that what forest health is on any given location or for any given stand is going to vary from person to person, from forester to forester, landowner to landowner, etc. It's going to mean something different to everybody because it's its perceived condition. Coming up through forestry school, my concept of forest health and how to deal with it or manage for it was that if you just manage the forest the right way, okay, then its forest health or its health or overall condition is guaranteed. Um, certainly, that, again, that was my idea coming up through school. Since then, I've kind of modified that where that traditional management is essential but it's no longer just enough to go out there and manage it. Um, there's, there's such an interaction between the forest management activities we do, along with invasive species, insects, diseases, water quality, all these kind of factors need to be accounted for when we're thinking about and trying to manage for forest health. So what affects forest health in Mississippi? One of the biggest things we have are insects. Um, we have a large variety of tree species here in Mississippi and across the southeast. And for every one of those tree species, there's, a, there's an insect out there that attacks it in one way or manner, way, shape, or form. Okay. Most of these insects, however, cause very few problems under normal conditions. And I'll go over a couple of examples. One is the Paley's weevil. This insect feeds off of uh, off slash. So they're attracted to fresh logging slash. Well, they'll go in, infest the slash, make more weevils, and once the slash is no good for, you know, doesn't, it does not serve as good habitat for them anymore, they'll move on to the next thing that they can find. So if you have a fresh logging slash next to a freshly planted pine plantation, that's not going to work out well because there's a really good chance that the weevils, if they're present, will move from that slash to your trees and kill them. So to manage for the Paley's weevil, you harvest in the summer, the slash dries out, and by the time you plant in the winter, it's not going to be a problem. Or you can get your seedlings treated um, before planting so that they're able to suppress the weevil. Red-headed pine sawfly is another common insect we find in our southern pine forests. Um, it's a defoliator of our, of our trees and it affects ornamentals just as well as it will the trees in our pines. Normally it doesn't cause much of a problem. Um, recently, I've seen a, I saw a plantation that, that had a severe uh, sawfly infestation in it. After a few years, the trees normally outgrow it, and then the sawfly becomes, isn't much of a problem. But the southern pine beetle, this is a whole nother critter. This, this is the worst of the forest insects we have in our southern forests. You know, an outbreak in East Tennessee between 1999 and 2002 killed over 300,000 acres of pine trees in Tennessee and moving into the Carolinas and um, Virginia. And most recently, its cousin, the mountain pine beetle, has damaged millions of acres of conifer forests in the western United States and western Canada. 
The insects are, are very similar. They're obviously related. They cause the same kind of damage. So this is a uh, very serious insect pest. In the south, when we talk about southern pine beetles, there are five beetles that we're talking about. There's the southern pine beetle, which again is the worst of the lot. We have three species of Ips and Graver beetles, and then there is the black turpentine beetle, which is the biggest of, all of them. Okay. Ips beetles are native insects and have been causing damage, significant amounts of damage to our pine timber in recent years. Um, damage of, by Ips is characterized by individual branches dying off in a crown. Um, normally when a southern pine beetle attacks a tree the, and the crown starts to die, the whole crown goes at one time. Um, with Ips beetles, part of the crown will die for no apparent reason and the rest of the crown is live. You see that? You have Ips beetles. Okay. Best thing we can do to prevent southern pine beetle, Ips, and the black turpentine is to keep our stance thin. Thinning our stands at the right time and the right way keeps the residual trees vigorous, increases spacing between the trees, making it harder for the beetles to congregate. Okay. Now, I mentioned up front that we have a great species diversity of trees here in the south, and because of that, there's a whole slug of other insects that attack our trees. Um, some of these are red-headed and clear-wing borer, clear-wing borers that affect our hardwoods. We have ambrosia beetles, which, will, which mostly affect our pine trees. We have longhorn beetles, which affect hardwood trees, ants, termites, the red oak borer, which did a significant amount of damage to mature red oaks in the Ozark National Forest here um, around between 2000 and 2004, killed thousands of acres of oak trees in, um, in the Ozarks. Red Bay ambrosia beetles and it is a non-native invasive insect that's killing off bay trees across the, the southeast. And of course the emerald ash borer, which um, I don't think it's officially in the southeast yet, or at least they haven't found it, but it certainly has been killing trees across the lake states in New England. Diseases. There are many diseases which affect our forests. Most of the time these diseases don't cause a whole lot of damage. They're there, they kill off trees, they reduce their value, whatnot, but they, they aren't normally something that we're too terribly concerned with. Um, some, some diseases are invasive and are, are vectored by insects. A couple of good examples is thousand cankers disease, which came to us from Colorado of all places. It migrated east and it has been um, affecting trees, primarily black walnut trees in Tennessee for the last several years. And laurel wilt, which is introduced by the red bay ambrosia beetle, again is killing laurel trees throughout the southeast. One of the biggest diseases we do have though is called fusiform rust and it affects our southern pines. Um, it needs, like all rust, it has a two-year life cycle and in this case it uses oak as its alternative life host. And the location of the infection dictates the severity of that infection on an individual tree. You have the infection on a branch, that's not such a big deal. You can cut off the branch, remove it, life's okay. You get the infection in the middle of the stem or the main part of the stem, you can forget it. That tree's never going to make it, certainly to saw log size or probably even to pulpwood size. Invasive species are becoming an increasingly large problem across the country, not only here in the southeast. And, and certainly, in my opinion, this is the biggest threat to health of our forests nationwide. These invasive species may be plants, they may be insects, they may be diseases or a combination thereof. And not only do they kill our native trees, but they also take up space for our native trees and other plants, changing the ecology, changing the wildlife habitat, and displacing many species of plants and animals. And that may be the single biggest threat that invasive species pose. Kudzu, of course, is a uh, very common invasive species found throughout the southeast. Um, its vines covered the ground so thoroughly it was believed to prevent erosion. So they started, they being the, the uh, USDA, started planting it back in the 1920s. Come to find out it doesn't do anything for it to stabilize soil, or, you know, to prevent soil erosion. It just overtakes everything. And in the picture I have here, it's even encroaching upon Atlanta, Georgia. One day it might even make it and take over Atlanta. It likes to grow in open spaces and it does not like to be shaded. It'll take over fields, plantations, yards, etc. And, and I must say it is no longer a southern problem. I have a colleague in Ohio who told me that over half the counties in Ohio are infested with kudzu. Okay. Sounds like a crazy thing, but I think kudzu would grow just fine in Ohio. 
Um, so kudzu, a very bad problem we have here in the southeast, and it's moving north. Kogon grass, as bad as kudzu is, I think kogon grass is worst. Um, it is a huge problem along the entire Gulf Coast, certainly from Florida through um, and into Texas. I believe it's a worse weed pest than kudzu, and I think given time, I think the kogon grass and kudzu gone head to head, I think the kogon grass would kill out the kudzu. You need to be able to identify and to control this stuff in order to keep it from taking over our forests and rangelands. It too likes to grow, it'll grow in full to partial sunlight. Um, it likes areas that are disturbed, but it doesn't like areas that are frequently disturbed. Okay, so you'll find it along roadways where it gets mowed from time to time, but you're not going to find it in places like in a yard where it's mowed constantly or in a farmer's field where there's constant cultivation and use of herbicides and other things. Okay? And, it, and you can't really burn it because it burns very hot. It has a high silica content. You can't graze it because it has a high silica content. So it really doesn't have any good uses. It flowers in early to mid-spring, and here in the southeast, when it flowers, it's, it is the only thing that's like it that's flowering. It's very distinctive. The blades are yellow-green in color, and the midrib is offset from the center. Most of the time, you'll have that midrib, and it's called a midrib for a reason because it's in the middle. On kogon grass, it's offset. A very easy way to, to uh, distinguish that is kogon grass. It spreads by rhizomes and seed. So if you take a tractor through an area, or let's say there's a bush hog from the highway department mowing along the edge of the road and there's some, some uh, kogon grass growing there, and it gets up a little bit of, of a root on, on the wheels, and they take it down the road, and they set the mower down again, and they start mowing again, and that root gets introduced, that's, how, that's one of the main ways in which kogon grass spreads. Its seeds are also very sticky, and they'll stick to everything, to the, like to the grill of this tractor, They'll stick to your dog if it's running through it. They'll stick to you if you're walking through it. So, you know, it's very um, opportunistic in terms of how it regenerates itself. It's essential to keep equipment and yourself and pets and things clean if you're doing anything in areas where there's kogon grass. Okay. What to do if you find it? Please take some immediate action. Contact someone that can verify its identification, be it someone with the USDA, um, your state forestry agency, your extension office, somebody that can help I, uh, confirm the identification and then find out what the treatments are to take immediate control measures. Again, we have information at msucares.com and at um, foresthealth.msstate.edu which talks about kogon grass, how to identify it, and how to control it. Emerald ash borer, for those watching this who are from the north, um, you probably already have a pretty good idea of what this insect is. It's a non-native invasive insect introduced from Asia, first found in the, in the Detroit, Michigan area around 2002. I grew up in northern Michigan, and they say that the emerald ash borer lived in Detroit for about 10 years before it finally reached detectable levels. So any, anything that can live in Detroit for 10 years has got to be pretty tough. That's a pretty hardy bug. Since its discovery, it's been found in 14 states, just most recently in, the, in Massachusetts. It's been found as far south as southern Missouri and Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, it's killed millions of trees in the, in the lake states and in New England, and it has the potential to spread and cause much more damage. Um, the economic losses, certainly, you know, the loss of shade trees in urban environments is bad, but in Mississippi, ash makes up about fifty million dollars worth of stumpage to landowners a year in harvest value. So potentially the emerald ash borer coming to Mississippi and other states in the south can have a very negative um, impact on our forest landowners. The Red Bay Ambrosia beetle, I mentioned this, uh, this individual earlier, it's found in the coastal areas from the Carolinas at least through Mississippi. Um, it attacks all members of the Lauraceae family and it introduces laurel wilt disease. And it is a severe threat to the avocado industry in Florida. The spread of this insect could affect the avocado industry in California as well. So uh, this is, again, a very damaging insect. And then there's natural disturbances. There's all kinds of bad stuff that just happens. There's hurricanes, tornadoes, fire, ice storms, floods. You name it, all sorts of other things happen and impact our forests. 
How these events impact our forests depends in part on the condition of our forests at the time of these events, what management activities we, you know, we, we're willing to undertake and have undertaken, and, and to be perfectly honest, a little bit of luck. The picture here is a uh, stand from, from South Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina came through. And you can see the kind of damage that Katrina did. Okay, so what can we do about all of this stuff? I've given you all a lot of doom and gloom, but what can we do to help protect the health of our forest and well-being, if you will, of our forests? The single best thing I think we can do is be proactive. Okay, be out there and managing our forest stands, know our forest stands, and, and manage them appropriately. Learn more. Be an active member, and if there's, you have a local, state, or national forestry or landowner association, be a member. Be active and take advantage of opportunities afforded by those organizations to learn more about forest health and other related issues. Okay? There are also a number of trustworthy sources on the Internet that you can use um, to get more information. Don't just stick your head in the sand and, you know, and say, oh, it's not going to happen to me. Um, I think one of the most important lessons we learned out of Hurricane Katrina, you know, it damaged 7 million acres of pine timber across Mississippi. So not only, you know, we always say it won't happen to me, not only can it happen to me, but Katrina showed that it could happen to all of us at the same time. Okay. Be proactive, okay? Perform better civiculture. Um, if you have pine stands, whether, or conifer stands, whether they're here in the south, or you have them in the western states or in the lake states, manage them appropriately. Um, thinning your pine stand at the appropriate time increases the future value of that stand, brings in a little bit of intermediate income, and helps keep the southern pine beetle, mountain pine beetle, ips, and other critters at bay. Right. If you're doing it in any kind of prescribed burning, which I'm a huge advocate for prescribed burning, it's one of the single best and most effective wildlife management tools we have. But take care that, that you minimize uh, crown scorch. Don't get the fire so hot that it's burning up the crowns of the trees that are left behind. You do that, you're going to stress those trees, you're going to damage them, wound them, and make them susceptible to insects and diseases. We need to plant the right species on the right site and then manage them the right way. Okay? We, do, we have gotten, you know, we've planted, for example, loblolly pine on all kinds of sites, and some of which I don't think loblolly pine should have been planted on. And so those trees sometimes will exhibit or be the first to exhibit problems. They'll, they'll, you'll see health issues with them because they're planted off-site or they haven't been managed the right way. Plant your species the right, on the right site the right way and manage them appropriately will certainly help maintain their overall health and vigor. And don't plant non-native species. We've already talked about kogon grass. Well, you may see kogon grass advertised or sold as something called Japanese blood grass. And it said that it's sterile and that it doesn't reproduce and that it doesn't act like regular kogon grass. Well, it does. It reproduces just like regular kogon grass. It acts just like regular kogon grass. It will go wild just like regular kogon grass and start raising cane. Okay? Don't plant invasives or non-natives. If you're, if you're a wildlife person, you like to hunt and you have food plots, don't plant non-native plants in your food plots. When landscaping, use native plants. Plants are already here, are adapted for here, that aren't going to take over here, like kogon grass will. Because uh, in controlling, preventing, controlling non-native and invasive species is a big job. As you can see from this curve, you know, if you detect it early, you have a much better and realistic chance of controlling it versus if you wait till it's up at the top of the curve, okay, where local control only may be feasible, but, but broad scale eradication is out of the question. Okay? With so many of our forest health issues, emerald ash borer, red bay ambrosia beetle, kudzu, kogon grass, we're at the top of this curve. Okay? Local, er, local control may be possible, but eradication is out of the question. Okay? Visit your forest land periodically. Look for, look for problems. You know, go out and enjoy the scenery, you know, enjoy hunting, hiking on it, whatever it is you like to do on your forest land. But while you're out there, you know, look up in the crowns once in a while. You know, take a look up. We don't look up often enough. Look for insect and disease problems. Familiarize yourself with what invasive species there are in your area. 
and find out what they look like and how to control them. So that if you find them, you, have a, you, you can make much better and informed decisions about how to control these things, how to protect your forest dam. And again, it's better to get them when they're small than to let them grow big. It's a whole lot cheaper and easier to handle when they're small. Okay. And by all means, we have got to stop moving firewood. Many insects and diseases move from one location to the next through firewood movement. Classic examples of the emerald ash borer. How did the emerald ash borer get into Detroit from Asia in the first place? Well, they think it came in wood packing material. Okay, then how is it spread from Detroit to, say, northern Michigan? Well, probably through firewood. Hunters taking it up with them. How did it go from, from I believe it was in Ohio, to southern Missouri? Because a hunter brought back some firewood from Ohio to southern Missouri and brought it with them. Okay, bad news. We don't need this happening. The same thing as how we feel Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle is moving so rapidly through the southeast. Okay, don't move firewood. If you're going somewhere, don't take firewood with you because God knows what problems, bugs, diseases, whatever you're taking with you. And please don't, take, don't bring firewood back home with you. Because heaven, again, heaven only knows what bugs, insects, diseases, whatever that you're taking from wherever it is you're going back to home. And certainly we can get more information through what I'm going to call reputable websites. I'm going to tout my own, of course, um, foresthealth.msstate.edu as information on all the subjects we've talked about here. Um, the, the U.S. Forest Service, your state forestry, wildlife agencies, your state national forestry, landowner associations, university websites, all provide sound, reputable advice and information on, on all kinds of forest health issues. Um, again, my caveat at the bottom is be careful where you get your information from. Make sure that it's from a reputable source. Okay, so in summary, again, there's all sorts of things which negatively impact the health of our forests. There's insects, diseases, invasive species of all kinds, natural disasters. Okay? The challenge we face as landowners, land managers, etc., is minimizing the impacts that these factors have on our forests while maximizing the goals of our forests or maximizing what it is we want to get out of our forest land. Okay. I believe proactive management is the best way to protect our forest, certainly from most, most forest health issues. You can have the best managed forest in the world and a wildfire comes through and it may, not, may just not matter. Or an, or an insect outbreak may happen and you could have the, the stand is in perfect condition for, you know, to fight off an insect outbreak, but if the insect populations are high enough, it may not matter. Regardless, the best thing we can do to prepare our forest is to be proactive in our management. It allows us to maintain forest vigor along with the ecological and financial benefits we receive from owning forest land. Okay. And we certainly need to cooperate across government and private boundaries. Again, the southern pine beetle, the mountain pine beetle, invasive species, wildfire, they don't stop at, at boundary lines. You know, they're not going to stop and say, oh, you know, I'm off forest service land, I can't go onto this private land or I can't go on, on to state land off private land, what, whatever the case may be. It just keeps on, they just keep on a going. Okay? We need to work together to manage and protect our forests. And don't be afraid to ask questions. There are lots of sources of, of re, reputable sources of information available. Um, again, foresthealth.msstate.edu, that's a pretty good site, I think. Um, there are lots of other reputable websites, okay? You can contact your state extension service, your state forestry agency, your forestry and landowner associations. All of us are here working together to, to help you, to provide you with information you need to make informed decisions about your forest land. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully um, through this presentation you've learned a little bit, you're questioning some things, you're going to go out and find out some more information so we can keep things like this, what's on the screen, from happening. Thank you all very much.